King. We can touch our background. Recording, I will send this on to Facebook and here we go. And now I'm going to start the webinar. The webinar is now live and participants are coming in. So we'll spend a few moments allowing people to um, sign in. It's now exactly on two o'clock. If you are here uh, for the OFIP seminar with Dr. Yusuf Monier, um, you are in the right place. And we're going to start within two minutes as people log in with the, um, the Zoom call. My name is Peter Larson. I'm with the Ottawa Forum and Media Palestine, and I'm with Yara Shufani, who I'm going to introduce also in a few minutes. People have to, registrants are still coming in slowly. Um, I'll just give it up one more minute and then we will start. Hmm. All righty, we are going to start now. So uh, once again, thank you very much. Welcome to everybody who's online. Thank you so much, Dr. Monier. Thank you very much, uh, Yara. Uh, this is going to be an interesting session and we're looking forward to having a good conversation today. I'm going to start off with a little bit of a, a background um, presentation, um, just so that um, we're all on the same page. Um, uh, Yara, tell me whether you see my, my my presentation. I'll make sure you can see it. Can you see it all right there? Yes. Yeah, okay. All right. So um, welcome to uh, this session. What are Palestinian Americans thinking about and doing about human rights for Palestinians? And our special guest, Dr. Yusuf Monier, we're very thrilled to have him um, today uh, to help us understand, help us Canadians, Canadians understand a bit better what's happening in the United States uh, today. Um, this is put on by the Ottawa Forum on Israel Palestine, which is a non governmental organization, volunteer organization based in Ottawa. And we are trying to promote a thoughtful discussion amongst Canadians about the Israel Palestine issue and what Canadian policy ought to be. Um, this session today is one of a series of monthly educational webinars that we started with COVID. So our next one, <clears throat> next uh, March 23rd, will be, <clears throat> excuse me, an interview with John Allen, who is uh, the former Canadian ambassador to Israel, Canada's third Jewish ambassador to Israel, a board member of the new Israel Fund of Canada, which is a liberal Zionist organization. And I'm gonna be quizzing him about his thoughts on achieving freedom, equality, and justice for both Palestinians and Israeli Jews. Now, John and I both know that we don't we have some views in common and some views we don't share. And so we will try to make that an interesting and educational conversation. Uh, the following month, we have Fianna Butu, who is a Canadian lawyer. All our speakers, uh, most of our speakers have been Canadian. Uh, Diana is actually on the um, advisory council of the Ottawa Forum on Israel-Palestine. And that will be talk she'll be talking about what future for Palestinians and Israeli Jews. And that'll be sort of a month after the Israeli election. And, just before when there might be elections in Israel, in Palestine. The agenda today is this little welcome, 
a little bit of background that I'm talking about now. Then I will introduce and we will have some discussion with Dr. Monier. Uh, Pierre Shifani and I will pose him some questions and it will be open up to questions and answers from the audience and we'll close at three o'clock. The session is being recorded and live streamed on Facebook and uh, everybody who's registered, whether they attend or not, will get a copy of the recording afterwards. Now, just a bit of background political context. Uh, Dr. Munier, uh, of course, lives and works in the United States. And um, uh, po po polls show that Americans are definitely more favorable to Israelis than they are to Palestinians. But a Pew Research poll shows that maybe the bias isn't quite as much as you might think. And this is sort of impressive given the huge amount of uh, Hasbro, huge amount of um, information, one might call propaganda from the Israeli side and the relative inability of the Palestinians to do that. And we'll talk to Dr. Munier about that. But according to this Pew poll, about 64% of Americans have a very or somewhat favorable view of Israelis and 46% have a similar favorable or, 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 or very or somewhat favorable view of Palestinians, which I find to be somewhat encouraging. Uh, when you look at the Israeli government uh, versus the Palestinian government, well, the numbers are not quite so positive for the Palestinian side. Um, there have been contradictory developments in the United States over the last four years during the Trump period, particularly. Uh, everybody will remember moving the embassy to Jerusalem, recognizing Israel, recognizing Jerusalem as the capital of Israel, uh, Israeli sovereignty over the West Bank, continued ethnic cleansing, and of course, various condemnations of BDS, closure of the PA diplomatic representation in Washington. And some of those things have been reversed uh, by the Biden administration. Um, on the other hand, we've had other uh, developments on the other side. We had the Black Lives uh, Matter movement and its links with the Palestinian solidarity. We have the squad uh, in, in, in the Congress. We have a phenomenon of Bernie Sanders, who explicitly criticizing Israel and a number of uh, 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 candidates for the president of the United States. We have the Peter Beinart phenomenon, which is very significant liberal Zionist intellectual who sort of move away from Zionism. And we have uh, US Jews increasingly split over the attitude they should take towards Israel. Co, um, co helping me interview Dr. Uh, um, Monier today is Yara Shupani. Uh, Yara is a Palestinian who lives in Toronto. She has a master's degree in political science and she actually did some work on the relationship between colonization and gentrification in the city of Jaffa. She is now the executive director of Canadian Friends of Seville. And in a minute, I'll just ask um, Yara uh, to say something about uh, uh, that organization. Before doing so, I want to turn to introducing our special speaker and issue a warm welcome to Dr. Yusuf Munier. He is now the non-resident fellow at the Arab Center in Washington. He is a Palestinian American specializes on the Arab-Israeli conflict. He was born in Lod, Israel. I'm gonna come back on that in a minute. He's a member of the editorial committee of the Journal of Palestine Studies, was the executive director of an organization that's now called the US Campaign for Palestinian Rights. He's been published in the New York Times and other major uh, publications, including Foreign Policy Magazine. In 2015, <clears throat> he was apparently identified, I got this off Wikipedia, as one of the most 100 most powerful Arabs under 40. And now that we're in 2021, I assume that he's one of the most 100 most powerful Arabs under 46, but we'll see, let's see what happens after. Dr. Munir holds a PhD in international relations and comparative politics from the University of Maryland. So thank you very much to both of you. And I wanna to get to, talk to, to talking to you, Dr. Munir, but before I do so, I just ask Yara, who's going to be helping me quiz you, uh, just say a word, Yara, un unmute yourself and say a word about us, um, the organization that you uh, work with. Sure, thanks so much for that, Peter. Uh, so yes, as Peter mentioned, I am joining you all from Toronto, and I work with Canadian Friends of Sabeel as their executive director. So CFAS, Canadian Friends of Sabeel, is an ecumenical organization and a registered charity here in Canada. Uh, we respond to the calls for solidarity from our Palestinian partners, often by working with the Canadian Christian community to engage, educate, and equip them as they do this crucial work. 
Um, if you would like to learn a little bit more about us, you can go to our website at friendsofsabil.ca. Uh, we're currently working on um, bringing virtual liturgies from Palestinian Christian leaders um, to integrate into online church services. And we're also working on a Christian Zionism conference. So um, you can learn more about us on our website. Thank you. Thank you, Yara. And I will be including the website in the follow-up email that goes out to everybody. All the registers. So thank you so much. So, um, Dr. Munir, can I call you Yousef? Is that okay? Can I? All right. Um, um, I'm gonna. We're gonna ask you a number of questions, and Yara and I have decided we're gonna treat this as if we were at a dinner party with you and sort of pepper you with questions pell mell. But where I want to start with a little bit about um, how does a man born in Lod, Israel, end up in Washington? And Lod, remind me, I may be wrong with my history, but Lod, I think, used to be called. Um, used to be called uh, uh, Lida. It was the Palestinian town of Lida. And in 1948, there was a one of the several terrible massacres in Lida. Uh, it was actually written up in a number of different places. I, I don't remember the exact number, but we're talking about crowding 100, maybe even more than that, people killed, driven out, and so on. You're born in that town, but at the time it was Israel. So uh, Lida was, according to the UN partition, actually not supposed to be part of Israel. It was to be part of the new Arab state, according to the partition. So your parents, I take it, were still there. How come and how do you come to be here? If you don't mind just telling us a little bit of your history, it'd be helpful. Sure, absolutely. And first, uh, thank you all for uh, for inviting me and having me speak uh, to your group. It, it's It's nice to be able to be with you uh, and I want to send, uh, you know, my greetings to all those uh, working uh, for and who care about Palestinian rights uh, in Canada. And I hope one day in the future, uh, in the post-pandemic world, we may be able to do this uh, in person again. Um, uh, you know, in regards to my personal background, yes, I was born in Elid. Uh, it, it is still called Elid to those who are from there. Uh, and, um, you know, my, my, my father was born there, my grandfather was born there, my great grandfather was born there and so on and so forth for as far back as our, uh, family has, uh, any record. We are, we are from, uh, the town of Elid. Um, and you, you're right to note, this is a, this is a town that is today inside, uh, the, the state of Israel. Uh, it was indeed one of the sites uh, of uh, one of the worst uh, massacres uh, of the uh, of war uh, during um, during 1948. Uh, the town was uh, besieged for several days uh, in July of 1948 um, and uh, ultimately fell. Uh, and in the course uh, of the hostilities, um, you know, uh, Israeli troops, what were were then Israeli troops by that point, uh, fired a uh, anti-tank missile into a mosque, uh, the Dahmesh Mosque in Elid, where there were uh, many uh, refugees uh, seeking shelter, uh, and um, you know killed scores uh, scores of people there. Um, so uh, you know, Elid, like you know, uh, hundreds of Palestinian towns and villages, uh, was depopulated of the vast majority of its native population during the Nakba. Um, a small number uh, of Palestinians were able to remain inside the state that became Israel. My uh, parents and grandparents were uh, among them. My parents were not yet born in 1948, but shortly thereafter. Uh, so it was my, my grandparents uh, who uh, had the lived experience of, uh, of the war, uh, as well as a number of my aunts and uncles who were, who were slightly older than my parents. Uh, and, and my parents, born in the newfound state of Israel shortly after that, uh, living uh, partly as internally displaced persons. Um, and so there's this, um, uh, I guess, category of Palestinians uh, who ultimately become Palestinian citizens of Israel uh, who were displaced during the Nakba, uh, but uh, did not become refugees in the sense that many refugees uh, became refugees in refugee camps, for example, and registered as refugees, uh, but were internally displaced. This means that they were forced from their homes, but otherwise resettled uh, or, or resettled themselves um, in the same areas or nearby towns uh, and, and villages. And for my family, 
uh, you know, that's that's the way it worked out. After many years um, being forced um, out of uh, out of uh, his home, my grandfather was actually able to win the uh, right to purchase his own house back from the squatters who had uh, essentially taken it over after 1948. Um, and so, uh, you know, both on on my my so got, side you're saying he family. bought back his own house, is that right? Yeah, he bought he, <laughs> he, he bought back his own house. Yeah. Um, uh, and and for those interested, I had done a, um, a thread on Twitter about this that that goes into much more much more detail um, uh, about you know my own my own family experience. Um, so it's just a little bit of sort of about uh, you know where uh, I come from. Um, you asked how I ended up here in the United States. I had very little to do with it. I came here at a, at a very young age. It was all my parents doing. Um, but uh, yes, I, I, I was born uh, in Elid. Um, I happened to be an Israeli citizen because of that, um, and also an American citizen. And I think, you know, I, I'm glad that you asked me this because I think that experience has really shaped the way that I come to understand. Israel, Palestine, uh, and also how I understand what is possible, what I what I what I hope is possible, uh, and uh, as well being able to um, you know draw on a, a Palestinian experience, uh, but but also have a intimate understanding of what the Palestinian citizen of Israel experience is like, and also having a sense of what looking at this issue. From outside of Israel, Palestine altogether is like um, has uh, played a significant role in shaping the way I think about this. Thank you. Thanks for that, uh, Yusuf. And I, we will, I, we can include a copy of the Twitter link um, in the email that we send out afterwards. So thank you. So Yara, I've been talking a lot. You haven't had much opportunity. Why don't you take first crack at our our guest here? Sure. Okay. So. Um... I'm going to ask one of uh, uh, one of the questions about um, the new administration. Um, so I guess we're wondering. We we all I think sighed a breath of relief when the Trump administration was voted out. But there's also I think a lot of anxiety about the Biden's administ Biden administration's um, you know what they're what they're likely going to pursue in terms of Israel Palestine politics. And so we're wondering um, how will the Biden administration's policy on Palestine differ from the previous one and whether things will change for Palestinian organizers engaged in advocacy and BDS on the ground uh, on the ground in the US. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, you know, obviously the Trump administration was um, an extreme version of things that we had seen previously. You know, um, American presidential administrations uh, have been extremely supportive of Israel over the years, consistently, whether they have been Republican or Democrat. Um, but the Trump administration, I think, took that to a completely new and unprecedented level. Um, and I, uh, you know, I, I, I sort of liken uh, the Israeli approach to the Trump administration very much to uh, a game show that used to be popular here in the United States many years ago called Supermarket Sweeps. Uh, and for those who remember the show, the way it worked was that the contestants had a limited amount of time to race through the aisles of the supermarket and grab as many things as they could and put them in their aisle and they get to keep them uh, at the end of the race. And that's <laughs> precisely how the Israelis approach the Trump administration. They saw a, a really unique and unprecedented opportunity to take full advantage uh, of an administration that was more in line with the far right in Israel ideologically um, than, than any other in history. Uh, and they went through their list, uh, whether it was demanding recognition of Jerusalem, recognition of the Golan Heights, um, you know, uh, and, and all of the many different things that the Trump administration did to go after Palestinians, closing the um, Palestinian uh, delegation office here in Washington, D.C., um, defunding, you know, Palestinian uh, humanitarian aid agencies, including UNRWA, so on and so forth, all kinds of attacks on Palestinians uh, in international fora, uh, you name it. The, the, the Trump administration almost, 
you know, ran out of goodies on their list to ask for. Uh, it's the, the Netanyahu government, I'm sorry, almost ran out of goodies to ask for because they were getting everything uh, that uh, that they could have wanted. And it culminated, of course, with the so-called Trump uh, peace plan uh, or, um, uh, you know, I forgot uh, forgot even what he, what he called it. Um, Deal of the century. The deal of the century. I mean, it had so many names, right? Um, uh, so, you know, in classic uh, Trump fashion, there was a, a, a lot of uh, a lot of talk and a lot of hot air, um, but it uh, uh, amounted to, you know, um, an Israeli fantasy uh, of uh, the United States essentially uh, green lighting and approving the continuation of the status quo forever. Um, and, and walking away from the idea of Palestinian statehood altogether um, and accepting a sort of, um, you know, uh, permanent Palestinian subservience to uh, a, a greater Israel that controls all of the territory. Um, so, you know, the Biden administration is not going to be that. Um, I think that's, uh, that's important. And I think, you know, even outside of the context of Israel and Palestine, um, many Americans breathe the sigh of, of relief that, um, you know, we were moving on from Trump for a whole host of reasons. Um, but on the Israel-Palestine issue, in particular, I think the Biden administration is going to be different. Um, but, you know, it's going to be more of a regression towards the mean uh, than it is going to be, you know, revolutionary change. Uh, and, uh, of course, we know that the mean has always been very much uh, supportive uh, of Israel. Um, so, you know, I, what, what I continue to caution people as, as, as important as I think it was that Donald Trump uh, does not have another four years uh, to make every one of Netanyahu's fantasies come true, um, I, I caution people to understand that there is not going to be a, a, a single presidential election that is going to liberate Palestine. Uh, that's not how this is going to happen. Uh, it's not going to happen because of, of an American election, you know, on, on one particular November. Uh, if there is going to be a shift in U.S. policy, um, it's going to take a, a change in the way that this issue is dealt with throughout the whole of government, starting from the bottom and rising to the top. Uh, and I think over the last several years, you know, we have seen a number of positive changes that suggest that those kinds of things are starting to happen. Um, but to get to a point where the outcome of a presidential election is actually going to matter in shifting U.S. policy in the right way, there's got to be a lot more of a foundation laid in building relationships uh, with parts uh, of the U.S. government and policymakers uh, below the executive branch. Uh, for for several years to come. Maybe I can just build on that um, because that also talks about uh, leads us to a discussion about what civil society thinks as an administration, electoral people, or a reflection to a large part of what public opinion is. Now, I, I hope you won't be. Uh, I want to say this carefully, but as a Canadian subscribing to Mondo Weiss or Electronic Indefada or or the Foundation for Middle East Peace. What I, I see a lot more activity and action amongst Jewish groups and church groups than I do from Palestinian Americans. I'm just ignorant of what um, Palestinian Americans are doing. Um, and you're in as good a position as anybody I know to sort of give an overview of what's happening. Um, uh, I know, well, I'll just leave it there. Please help us do a tour, what they call in English or in Canada, a tour d'horizon, kind of a, a survey of the horizon to see what's happening at the top level. Thank you. Yeah, sure. I mean, uh, I think it, it, it's important to sort of contextualize this in where the, where the Palestinian American community is in the United States um, and, and sort of its, uh, its history. Um, you know, you're talking about, as far as Palestinian Americans are concerned, you're talking about a, um, you know, an, an, an immigrant community that is now also a second generation community, I think in some cases a third generation community here in the United States that is um, 
uh, fairly recent. Um, you know, I think you obviously have uh, some parts of the community that can trace their roots back here, you know, a, a century or more, but um, significant waves came post 48 and more significantly post 67. Um, and so I think, you know, when we talk about any community's role uh, in the political process, it's important to understand sort of where uh, they are in their uh, sort of uh, historic trajectory um, uh, wi within the within the United States. Uh, and, you know, the first uh, generation of immigrants uh, is that generation of immigrants that's trying to survive. Uh, and, you know, their um, immediate objectives are figuring out how the heck things work in this country. Uh, how do I get my family set up here? How do the school systems work? How can I pay the bills at the end of the month? And so on and so forth. And, uh, you know, the next generation uh, is the generation that is, you know, better equipped, uh, but still not necessarily uh, the uh, uh, the generation that is going to go into uh, politics. Uh, it's it's usually in, in my observation been that third generation uh, where you know you're no longer worried about surviving, you know and you and you start thinking about involvement in society and, and culture in a in trying to think about the way to 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 put this where it really becomes about passion more than about need and necessity. So that second generation might often be encouraged uh, to not have to deal with the, the, the hardships of their parent generation and go into um, you know, professional fields, whether it's medicine or engineering or law and so on and so forth. Um, and it's, it's that third generation that becomes, I think, more comfortable uh, within a particular community that gets involved in really um, shaping the direction of uh, that country in a more, um, more hands-on way. And so I think it's, th that's an important part of um, the answer to the question is that in general, you know, the, the, the Palestinian American community is just earlier on on that trajectory. And, um, you know, at, and because of that, we're seeing a lot of Palestinian American energy and dynamism on this front from the youngest generation of Palestinian Americans. Uh, and so where you do see, um, you, you know, the kind of uh, engagement and activism uh, by groups within the Palestinian American community, they tend to be uh, led by uh, student groups, uh, youth groups, um, and, and cultural organizations that, that tend to be dominated by the younger generation. That's, that's a, that is a wonderful thing, and that is a thing that I think bodes very well for the community um, in the future. But it, it's, it's, a, it's a function of also where the community is. And, you know, when we're talking about um, the, the broader sort of work for Palestinian rights, of course, it's not just Palestinian Americans that are doing this work. It's crucial that Palestinian Americans are involved in this work. Um, but uh, as you mentioned, there's a whole range of um, identity groups and organizations um, that are working on this, whether they are um, coming at this in an interfaith lens, uh, groups that happen to identify as Jewish or Christian, uh, or uh, groups that are concerned with particular themes like human rights organizations and so on. Um, there, there's a wide range of groups in the United States that are uh, working on these issues, and many of them you know, come from or, or are composed of people from communities uh, who are much further along in that, in that journey here in the United States. Um, so I think that's one of the reasons why you, why you see that kind of disparity, but at the same time, um, there are plenty of groups doing uh, important work now, uh, and you're starting to see the, um, the fruits of that change translate now um, upwards from uh, the youth into the professional class, which I think is which I think is really really important, and that's sort of the next step forward. Um, the the people who were active working on Palestinian rights on campuses and in the university groups 10, 15 years ago um, are increasingly now uh, moving into um, the professional class and managerial classes in in a lot of different spaces here in the United States and having their voices in the room 
um, when decisions are being made on lots of different things that touch on Palestine directly or tangentially, uh, whether it's uh, things like um, you know racism or uh, the question of war and, and militarism, um, civil rights and civil liberties. Um, the conversations around these things are changing in part because there is a different generation um, that is now starting to have their say. And I think that bodes very well for um, for Palestinian rights work in the United States. Is there any attempt to kind of um, pull these strands together into some kind of national organization or is it too early for that from your point of view? Well, there are some national organizations. You know, you have, for example, a National Students for Justice uh, in, uh, in Palestine. Um, you know, you have uh, organizations, for example, like uh, the one that I was uh, directing for some time, the U.S. Campaign for Palestinian Rights, which was, um, you know, a, an organization that uh, sort of uh, supported a coalition of uh, hundreds of groups, some of which were Palestinian, many of which were not. Um, uh, so there are efforts like that. I also think that, you know, um, there are some strengths to, you know, um, movements like this being decentralized. Um, and um, especially since so much of the work is done at the local level, sometimes um, the approach of nationalizing this kind of work has drawbacks uh, as well. That's something, um, you know, in, in doing work at U.S. Campaign for Palestinian Rights, we often we often saw and tried to to navigate uh, around, um, but uh, but yeah, there is there is some of that. Thank you. Um, I'm going to turn to Yara in a second, but I remind people who are watching that uh, we will be uh, drawing questions out of the Q and A box. So at the bottom, if you have questions, uh, type them in the Q and A box, please, and I'll be uh, watching that as we go forward. Yara, over to you. Yeah, thanks so much for that, Yusuf. And I think we we um, this. Uh, leads nicely into the next question um, because I, I personally saw a lot of this engagement um, from Palestinians, whether that be you know Linda or Linda Sarsour or Noura Erkat and others, and and some of that organizing actually um, helped uh, engage Palestinians in the Bernie Sanders campaign, which is which was interesting to watch. Um, and so uh, the next question I have here is. So the U.S. campaign for Palestinian rights had a lot of successes working with progressive politicians like Betty McCollum and others. Uh, how are Palestinians organizing to support progressive elections and how effective are these progressive candidates in shifting the discourse around the U.S.'s role in the occupation? Yeah, so I mean, I think one one thing that's important to understand in trying to answer this question is sort of the 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 kind of, I, I, it's almost revolutionary. I know it, it may be hard to really see that, but the kind of revolutionary change that has taken place um, on this issue in the United States it has not translated into policy yet, that's for sure. Um, but in terms of what is possible and how people understand what is possible, there has been significant change. What do I mean by that? Um, you know, if if you're familiar with 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 the politics of the United States on this issue, you know that um, uh, not only is the U.S. government very much pro-Israel, uh, but the uh, Congress of the United States uh, is uh, extremely quote unquote pro-Israel, um, almost reflectively reflexively so, um, in a way that goes well beyond representing where public opinion is. Um, and that disparity is explained in, in very large part by the role of uh, uh, organized and influential interest groups um, who are working to uh, enhance the U.S.-Israel relationship um, and ensure that the United States continues to support Israel. Um, so, you know, for people who are working on Palestinian rights in this context, for many years, um, you know, trying to get your member of Congress uh, to do the right thing on Palestine has been like banging your head up against a brick wall. It's very, very, very frustrating. And, you know, when you are in uh, the, um, you know, you're, you're in the work of organizing and trying to build a movement, you need people to feel hope. You need people to see wins. And so if you keep telling people to write your member of Congress uh, and, you know, go down to the office and engage your representative, 
uh, and all you're getting is uh, the same, you know, sort of uh, APAC type talking points from them year in and year out and not seeing any space for change, it's really hard to grow a movement that way. It's really hard to build hope that way. So I think that is one of the reasons why uh, I would argue um, the, the Palestinian call for boycott, divestment, and sanctions was so important and revolutionary uh, in the American context in particular. Uh, because, you know, I used to end conversations like this, um, which would always, you know, come down to a question and answer session with members in the audience. There would somebody stand up and say, what, what can I do? What can I do to, to help, to create change? And, you know, after a while, it just becomes uh, really difficult to keep telling them to go talk to their member of Congress who's not going to help them in any way, who's not going to take this issue seriously. What the call for boycott, divestment, and sanctions did was it gave people who cared about this issue a way to get involved in changing it in institutions where um, they had a, a, a much better opportunity at creating change, whether it was at the, their university, whether it was at their uh, churches or their local institutions, uh, at, at the local government level, um, at their co-op grocery stores, right? Um, when, when, when you were in a much more level playing field, when you did not have to go up against interest groups that had, you know, entrenched relationships with members of Congress for 50, 60 years, um, change was far more possible. And so you started to see um, BDS wins. Um, and I think this was really important because it gave people a way to see a path forward to feel that their work on this issue was being rewarded, was leading to change. And that led to an even more important thing, uh, which was a belief once again that engaging in the electoral system was worth it, right? Um, and that is really, really important and new uh, and coincided at the same time with this massive partisan divide in public opinion on the question of Israel-Palestine that created among Democrats in particular, uh, fertile ground to do work in building relationships and creating change. And so you had, I think, an activist base that suddenly started rediscovering the worth of engaging in electoral politics again, at the same time as the opportunities began to open up because uh, of this partisan divide. And that led to people dedicating their, their efforts to getting involved in electoral politics in ways on this issue that we had not seen before. Um, it, it, it led to you know, people like Rashida Tlaib, um, like AOC, like Ilhan Omar, like Bernie Sanders. Um, and you know, it's, it's in the past, it's frustrating to spend your time and effort and money working for a candidate that's not going to move forward. But when you see that people who take these positions are not only getting elected, but are also getting reelected, right? Um, it energizes you to continue doing this work, redouble your, your efforts and to continue to invest in their success. And so this has created a new path forward for change that I think is really uh really important and we're just beginning to see that start now in congress i think we're going to see a lot more of it um down the line and it's the kind of change that we need to see yeah well we're definitely that's a very hopeful i think we all feel very hopeful watching things uh shift and you know seeing folks like uh, corey bush elected i think there's a lot of um hope at least for, for me as a Palestinian, um, you know, looking at the U.S. politics uh, situation. Yes, and I'd like to just change gears a little bit. <clears throat> you were one of the um, first Palestinian Americans that I was aware of that um, came out very strongly for a one-state solution. Um, there have been others, and Ali Abu Nima is also Done that another, but you were one of certainly one of the early ones, one of the vocal ones. And I wanted to um, quiz you not so much on whether or not that's a good idea, which I think 
a lot of Canadians might think that makes sense, but I'm interesting, interested in why that ha doesn't seem to have been taken up more strongly by Pal the Palestinian community, either the Palestinian leadership, Fatah, um, Hamas, and so on, or even within the Palestinian American community. There seems to be a lot of different people talk about it, but never seems to be a snowball that, 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 that gets packed together. First of all, do you agree with my assessment? And then can you explain why that might be the case? Well, a couple of things I would sort of um, point out in response. Um, you know, th this is not a new idea. Um, you know, I'm certainly not uh, the, the first to, to talk about it, even among Palestinian Americans. The other day I was um, rereading an article by Edward Said in the New York Times back in 1999 called, you know, the case for the one state solution or something like that. And I think um, you know, he had he had been publicly talking about this before that as well. But I, I think even before that, you know, um, there were uh, there were people talking about um, this uh, as the way forward. Um, and, you know, I would also point out that it, it, it's not that, you know, the Palestinian leadership has not called for this. They have called for it. In fact, their original position uh, prior to the adoption of this, this two-state vision uh, was for a secular democratic state of Palestine encompassing the entire territory and everybody that lives there regardless of religion. So, um, you know, a, a, some version of this uh, was the uh, sort of initial position uh, of, the, of the Palestinian leadership and they diverged from that. Um, and, and they diverged from that to go down a path that they believed was going to uh, yield a result, some better result, some plausible result. Um, and I think, you know, one of the things that has um, led so many more people back to, uh, back to this vision um, is that we've, we've saw what the alternative has led us to. Uh, we've saw what, um, you know, this this endeavor uh, to achieve a Palestinian state by, you know, kindly asking Israel to give the Palestinians one uh, and hope that the United States supports uh, the process hasn't resulted in an independent Palestinian state. In fact, uh, what it has resulted in instead is, you know, nearly three decades now of political cover for uh, Israel's continued and expanded settlement enterprise um, in the West Bank, uh, leaving less and less and less land for Palestinians um, uh, and making the prospect of an independent and contiguous Palestinian entity, um, you know, uh, fanciful. I mean, it's, it's just anyone who looks at a map now um, and, and looks at uh, how uh, the land is intertwined and looks at how the populations are intertwined, just to, practically speaking, um, it's only become more difficult over time. Uh, and, you know, this peace process aimed at a two-state solution has made that possible, not the other way around. Um, so, you know, I, I think that, um, you know, there are, there are reasons to support a one-state solution as your preferred sort of outcome. Um, and, and you can point to things like normative qualities around um, equal rights uh, and, um, and so on. But there's also the practical issue here, <coughs> excuse me, which is simply that where are you going to put two states here? How are you, how are you unscrambling this egg? It, 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 does not, it does not seem possible in any way. And we have a one state reality today. We have a one state problem. Um, and so I, I think that's one of the reasons why this vision, <coughs> excuse me, is attracting more and more uh, supporters today. Um, just a one tiny follow up and then I'll flip it over to you, Yara. Um, the, the argument I often hear from people as well if Israel isn't willing to give a two-state solution, like what, what would possibly lead you to believe that a one-state solution is even in the cards? I mean, it's really, it's really not only up to Israel at the end of the day. Um, 
you know things things don't only happen because one one party decides that they're going to mm -hmm. um the reality is that after 100 years of zionist settler colonialism in palestine the palestinian people remain in palestine uh not in the numbers that they once were um, but in significant numbers uh, half the population between the day uh, is palestinian arab um we are not going away uh nor is this problem and so you know the israelis can say that they don't uh want to uh have a, a one state outcome we have a one state reality today and so it's only a matter of time before this becomes an issue of having to address inequality within a single state um and at that point the israelis can resist it in the same way that you know the confederate states resisted the principles of equality that the apartheid regime in south africa resisted the principles of equality um but it, uh, it it's not a it's not a course of action that i would advise uh, it doesn't uh, end up well in most situations um and and ultimately i think change is going to happen is it going to happen in the near term no probably not but the reality is as i said um you may dismiss palestinians in your mind but we remain there we remain in palestine uh and for as long as that is the case um we are we are not going to be out of sight even if we want to put us out of mind okay thank you sir uh yara your turn yes okay well um i'm gonna uh, i guess jump back for a second to the question of organizing i think lots of folks on this call are really engaged with some of the work that you highlighted in terms of contacting our members of parliament and really trying to get some action um, and some movement on this particular issue. And so I was wondering what are some of the main lessons that you draw from all of your experience with this work um, in terms of changing US opinion on Israel and Palestine? And what are some things that you feel made that uh, successful, uh, whether that be kind of engaging with Benny McCollum or any other MPs that you felt you, you had a lot of success with and uh, what lessons we can learn uh, from that here in Canada? Let me see. There's a lot. Um, Great. <laughs> I mean, I guess the first thing uh, I would say is, is, is don't get discouraged. Um, I know that, that that's not often easy, but uh, wins are possible. Um, look for the wins that are possible and, and achieve them and build on them. Um, it may not it may not work easily to uh, walk into a, a member of parliament's uh, office and demand change and immediately get it. That's usually not the way that it's gonna work, um, but you can build towards that. And you have to think strategically about how you build towards bigger change with smaller change. Um, and in the process of doing so, um, building coalitions and bringing in people who would not necessarily be working on this issue otherwise. Um, you know, we, we, we need to find ways to grow out the number of allies that we have. And the, the good thing, you know, on this issue is that when you educate people about this issue, uh, it's very easy for people to quickly identify with, uh, with the goal of supporting the human rights of Palestinians because it's fundamentally about equality and fairness. And even if you don't really have a, a direct connection to the issue, you can identify with that and the importance of that. Um, and so, you know, I think those are some of the most important things that, that, uh, that I've learned uh, over time. Um, do the work and bring people with you, uh, I think is, uh, is most important. And understand that you can't have big wins before you have small wins. Um, and, and even while that's the case, don't be afraid to reach for bigger wins uh, over time. Um, uh, and, 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 you know, work, uh, uh, work strategically as you do it. Um, I think those are some of the, those are some of the, uh, key things. And, you know, I guess the, the last thing that I would sort of say on this is to understand that, and I think most people get this now more so than ever before, um, that this issue is not isolated. This issue is not disconnected from other issues that are uh, important today. Um, 
you we need to understand that you know this is an this is an issue that very much relates to inequality and very much relates to racism and very much relates to settler colonialism and very much relates to militarism and there are a number of different intersections um, with um, interest groups uh, that allow you to begin building relationships and coalitions um, that can you know lead to change um, so i think it's important to, to think about palestinian rights in that context and work strategically with that in mind Are you satisfied with his answer, Yeah. Yes, yes, thank you, that's great. <laughs> okay, um, um, Yosef, we, we live and work in, um, in Ottawa, as I do. Um, as a Canadian who's not Palestinian, I feel uh, uncomfortable uh, going far, very far into internal Palestinian politics. Uh, at the same time, I don't feel very comfortable with um, uh, either of the two dominant parties, uh, either Fatah, PLO, PA, which is sort of a, um, a nest together I can't quite pull apart, or Hamas. Um, what what attitude, given the fact that the, the PA or PLO is involved in security coordination with Israel, um, seem to be responsible for some fairly significant human rights violations within the, the West Bank, what's the appropriate attitude in your mind for those of us who are not Palestinians or Canadians, um, it, is it appropriate for, appropriate for us to criticize the Palestinian leadership or should we just keep our mouths shut? What, what do you think is the right way to act? Oh, I certainly don't think there's any problem with criticizing the Palestinian leadership. I think they deserve um, a lot of uh, criticism um, uh, and, and not just you know the Palestinian leadership, but, but a number of uh, the Palestinian factions uh, and so on, um, and I, you know, I don't think that you should be uncomfortable to uh, do so, particularly from the perspective of human rights violations, uh, even if you're if you're not Palestinian. Um, you know, I, I I think that sort of legitimate criticism is is necessary. Um, you know, with with that being said, I think it it's a question of how does one how does one in your position in Canada or in the United States or, or elsewhere around the world practice solidar solidarity? What does that look like? Um, and, you know, I think one of the, the great things about the Palestinian call for boycott, divestment and sanctions uh, is that it is a, a call that comes from Palestinian civil society really to international civil society. And the great thing about that is that it allows um, it, it allows all of us uh, who are, you know, not if, if you are not Palestinian and living outside of uh, Palestine and so on, to practice solidarity in a way directly with the Palestinian people, um, circumventing some of these political issues, uh, while still having a very real life and political impact. Um, and so I think the question, you know, for folks like yourself and folks here in the United States who are not Palestinian is not so much you know, what can I do about the Palestinian government, but what can I do about how my government's policies are uh, impacting the lives of Palestinians? Uh, and that's what the, uh, the call for boycott, divestment and sanctions is really asking for us to do, um, to uh, demand for and address uh, the complicity of our communities, our governments, uh, in the human rights abuses uh, of uh, Palestinians uh, through their support for Israel. Um, so, you know, absolutely, you know, criticize all you want, uh, you know, with legitimate criticism of, of, of anybody, Palestinian leadership uh, included. I think that's totally fair. Um, but, uh, but that, uh, you know, should not in any way prevent us from being in solidarity with the Palestinian people in their struggle for freedom, justice, and equality. Um, and, it, and it doesn't have to be. Uh, and I think that, you know, uh, the, the BDS call has given us the roadmap for um, for how to do that. Thank you. Okay, that's great. And I see that there are a number of questions that have come in that uh, pertain to BDS. So we'll come back on that um, a bit in a moment. So if you have questions, uh, click on the bottom on the Q&A and put the questions in. In a second, I'm going to see whether we can get uh, Karen Walker to help us ask those questions. We don't have a little trouble connecting with Karen. We don't know if that's going to work or not. 
But Yura, over to you, maybe for a last question from us, and then we'll turn it over to the audience to um, have a go at this. Chip and Yara? Sure, I had one last question that I was hoping to ask you, and it's not super related to American politics, but I think it's really uh, timely. So, you know, we're seeing a lot of Gulf states in particular, states that we, you know, maybe there's been a perception that these are states that are uh, allies of, of Palestine, um, that are normalizing relations with Israel. Um, and I'm just curious what you think the impact of this will be moving forward, whether we should be expecting kind of other Gulf states to follow suit um, and, and what this means for, for the Palestinian uh, state or, you know, uh, Palestinians who are working towards statehood. Yeah, look, I, the, 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 the Palestinian struggle is a struggle uh, against a military occupation uh, against discrimination and apartheid, uh, it's uh, a struggle for people to be free. Uh, regimes that are um, not affording their own citizens freedom, justice, and equality, uh, we're never going to be our allies in this struggle in a real way. Um, what, what we know is that uh, throughout the region, and public opinion polls have uh, shown us this time and time again, um, the issue of Palestine continues to be uh, one of the most, if not the most important issues to Arab publics, including in countries that have normalized uh, their relations with Israel. Um, Arab publics continue to be opposed to their governments normalizing with Israel, again, including in those states which have already gone down the path of normalization. Um, so this is really not about the people. This is about the governments and the states and the regimes and so on. And, and they're going to pursue their own interests as they see fit. Um, and and I, would, I would say here, just as I, I said to, to Peter earlier, um, the, the work that we have to do is at the civil society level. Um, and when we think about solidarity, um, we need to think about how we can uh, address um, the complicity of our own governments in the situation of uh, Palestinian rights. So, um, you know, I think there's a lot more to talk about when it comes to this issue of normalization, sort of what kind of impact it would have um, on, you know, uh, all kinds of diplomatic questions, including in relation to the you know, what's, what's, what's left of the so-called peace process, what it means for the Palestinian Authority, et cetera, et cetera. And there's, there's a lot of conversation to have there. Um, but I think the bottom line is these regimes were never going to free Palestine for us. It was never going to happen that way. Uh, and, you know, the, the, the struggle for Palestinian freedom is also the struggle for the freedom of others throughout the region who want the same rights who are demanding the uh, same fundamental freedoms. Um, so uh, the people who are denying those rights uh, are not going to be the ones who are going to guarantee them for Palestinians. Thanks, Yosef. Um, Yara, um, we're going to, it's okay with you, Yara, I'll turn it over to the audience. Uh, I just want to give a call out. Karen Walker, can you can you hear us? Can you speak? Because uh, the idea was that you were going to manage the questions, but we seem to have a little technical link. If you can't, if you do, if you can speak, do so. Otherwise, I'll go through the questions because I have access to them here. Karen, all right, something is wrong with our system here, so I I apologize. Okay, well I will look at the questions. We have a number, and um, by the way, I remind people not only put your questions in, but you can also upvote if you click um, on an existing question because uh, you like it. Uh, Zoom automatically moves it to the top of the pile. So that will help us focus on the questions that uh, seem to have the most um, most bite. And the first one is on this. Uh, oh, no, no, we got a real we got a real um, e election going on here. Okay. Um, um, the first question from Desmond Wilson. I, I will read it here. Building on the confidence established established by the BDS. Uh, oh, Actually, this doesn't work out so because as you vote, it moves around and I can't read it. Building on the confidence established by BDS and the maturity of Palestinians within US society, what do you foresee will be the next key pressure points? And is there any direction coming from Palestine 
on this uh, on this issue. I mean, I think the conversation for a number of years, and I think we're still at this point, is figuring out how we get to the S. Uh, and by the S, I mean uh, sanctions, of course. Um, you know, we've we've seen a number of victories when it comes to boycott efforts, a number of victories when it comes to divestment, and so on. Um, and I think what's important to understand about these these things is that they're not all of equal weight, of course. Um, uh, and one leads into the other. Uh, we cannot get to the point where, uh, in my view at least, uh, victories on the S, the sanctions, are possible until we've laid the kind of groundwork uh, with victories on the B and the D. And I think I think we've done a lot of work in that regard. Um, you know, people have asked me, you know, why, you know, what kind of impact is it going to have if some you know, a random church denomination, in, you know, in the United States decides to pass a divestment resolution, you know, or even debates a divestment resolution uh, and decides to, uh, you know, let's say divest their, um, you know, $10 million holdings in this or that company um, that uh, is complicit in Israeli occupation. Um, what is that going to do? Well, I think what people don't understand is that the the impact of this work is not merely in dollars and cents, is not merely in the decisions that people make to actually divest. Those are important, and I think they send a message that is bigger than just the dollar signs themselves. But it's the work that is done to change minds in the course of doing that work itself that has a bigger impact. If we are not doing organizing work around divestment resolutions, chances are nobody is going to be talking about the issue of Palestinian rights at some random church convention in Kansas or Detroit or anywhere else, thousands of miles away from Palestine. It is a tactic that puts the issue on the agenda and it forces people to think about their own complicity in an issue that's thousands of miles away that they would otherwise never have thought about. And so the work of boycott, divestment, and sanctions, and boycott and divestment in particular, is as much, if not more so, about public education and institutional education than it is about actually achieving a, a, a shift in where the dollars and cents are going. Um, and that part of it, I think, is one of the, the, the pieces that is rarely, rarely understood. Uh, I don't think the shift in the conversation, particularly uh, among Democrats, uh, that exists today on the issue of Israel-Palestine would have been possible without, without you know, 10 to 15 years of boycott and divestment work happening at the institutional level in the United States um, uh, for, for, for all of these years. Um, it, it makes a huge difference. So we, that work needs to continue and to get to the S, and I think we're, we're, we're getting to a point where that becomes more possible, we need to build on that. Uh, and, and I think one of the ways in which that happens is through, um, at first, uh, efforts to support targeted legislation um, through the United States Congress um, and, and through even state legislatures, if that's possible. Um, to uh, call for accountability for uh, Palestinian human rights abuses. We've seen some of that legislation in the last several years for the first time uh, in the form of, um, uh, you know, Betty McCollum's um, uh, legislation that was introduced uh, in, uh, in 2017, uh, calling uh, for, you know, conditioning U.S. aid uh, to Israel based on its treatment of, of Palestinian children in Israel military detention. Um, you know, it's, it, it's, it's very simple. It's very straightforward. Uh, and yet at the same time, in the context of American politics was revolutionary because it's not something that had been possible before. That would not have been possible five years ago, uh, five years before that. Um, and it would not have been possible if the groundwork for it was not laid by tireless activists doing the work in institutions across the country to put this issue of complicity in Palestinian human rights on the agenda. And that was done through boycott and divestment uh, efforts. Um, so the B and the D work has to continue, I think, and that will continue to make the S type work 
achievable. Um, and I think the efforts uh, like uh, Betty McCollum's legislation are uh, a model for uh, how we start doing that. And of course, we need to build and expand on those efforts as well. I think, um, Yosef, um, it's useful to remind ourselves that the campaign against uh, South African apartheid was a brilliant campaign. But at the time, South Africa was a mining economy and boycotting its oranges and its wines were not a significant economic hit for South Africa, but it was a huge reputational hit because it, people were buying oranges and wines. And just as you say, uh, it becomes a, a way of raising this issue to public uh, public attention. And, and you know, I remind people too that the first, you know, of course, the uh, comprehensive anti-apartheid uh, sanctions that were passed by the United States Congress. Uh, uh, with a resounding majority that overturned a presidential veto in the late 1980s um, was you know, a, a massive success that people remember, but people forget that the first legislation that tied sanctions to South Africa was introduced in 1971. So you know, it, took, it took years to get from the introduction of legislation to the point where you had that kind of change on an issue, by the way, that I think was far less contentious in American politics than the issue of Israel-Palestine. So it's, import, it's important to, keep, as, as one thinks about strategy, it's important to keep in mind that um, uh, change is achievable, but it's also a long-term effort. And one has to build towards that long-term goal um, with, uh, with reasonable reaches across the way. Um, because that's how you build. That's how you build towards that change is, is, is step by step. But we're at a point now where we're beginning to see that kind of change possible to be introduced in the American legislature. We weren't there five years ago. So the question now is how do you build on that and grow it and take it to the next step? Um, we have a number of people who are interested in the whole question of Christian Zionism. And maybe you might have some thoughts on this, Yosef, but perhaps even Yara would as well, working in an organization that is primarily faith-based, if I have it properly. But uh, um, first, Yosef, how would you advise advocates who are trying to address Christian Zionism, recognizing it's a huge support for Israel and its policies? You know, I think, um, I think Yara is probably in a much better position to uh, answer this question than myself. I know that um, uh, you know, uh, Sabil, uh, friends of Sabil are at sort of the, the forefront of taking on some of these um, difficult conversations uh, often. Um, so I would definitely yield to, uh, uh, to you uh, on this, but it's become, you know, it's, it's, it's become a big issue, particularly here in the United States. And it has really come to define um, the Republican Party's support uh, for, for Israel. Um, uh, and it's, it's had a lot to do with the partisan nature uh, of, the, of the divide on this, um, on this issue in public opinion. Um, so, but yeah, I would love to hear your, your thoughts on this. Yeah, well, I mean, I, uh, I think that there's been a lot of really great resources created by organizations um, on how to deal with Christian Zionism. It's, uh, I know that in Canada, it's, just as much, I think, maybe a little bit less of an issue than the US. The US is a little bit more, I think the Christian Zionism discourse is, is, is quite large. And I think there's an organization, uh, KUFI, um, Christians United for Israel, I believe it's, uh, it's called. And they do a lot of lobbying work um, in the US. Here, I do think that there are, um, there's a little bit of kind of a assumed, like a lot of uh, faith communities, a lot of church communities, um, maybe have kind of assumed uh, positions that would be considered Christian Zionism or Christian Zionist without even really the understanding of what that means or, you know, without the necessary intention to be Christian Zionists. And so I find that those are really the best um, best communities to work with to unpack the issue. Um, it's quite hard, I think, to go up against folks who openly and proudly say, you know, I'm a Christian Zionist and and I'm I'm going to advocate uh, for my my beliefs and so on. And I think that those are um, the harder wins and the harder people to kind of win over. Um, but I do think that there's been a lot of success um, in different 
on, on a congregational level, but also on a denominational level in terms of, um, you know, working and pushing back against some of the more assumed Christian Zionist perspectives. Um, there's a lot of really good resources and I'd be happy to share some of those uh, with you, Peter, if you're going to send an email afterwards, okay. handbooks and kind of social action um, guidelines on how to respond. Um, I recently actually just got sent an incredible social action um, handbook from the Presbyterian Church of Canada um, on Christian Zionism, which I thought was really great. So um, I'll share those over with you, Peter, after, and you can you can circulate them. But I think there's some really helpful strategies there on how to talk to people who may engage with um, Christian Zionist beliefs and how to kind of identify um, what that looks like. Uh, and the best way, I think, is really working within the church community uh, bit by bit. And, you know, I think it's, uh, you know, you can have these big conferences and we've had a few, SEPAS has, has done a lot of work on trying to educate people on what Christian Zionism is, and we're working on something to do that um, virtually as well. But I really think that person-to-person -person engagement and that dialogue, if you've got folks in your church community that you know maybe don't understand why what they're saying would be considered Christian Zionism, that's really where you're gonna get a lot of wins um, because people are always so much more open to listening to members of their community kind of engage them on this issue rather than sort of you know, like national conferences, which they might not even want to attend because they might think it doesn't apply to them, right? So I think that that's really um, it, the problem in Canada is definitely some of that kind of uh, less explicit uh, Christian Zionism that you see. Thanks, uh, Yara, and I'll be glad to include that uh, reference for anybody who wants to follow up. Um, the next question um, has to do with the uh, announced elections. The, not, the, not the Israeli elections, uh, the Palestinian elections. And um, Yusuf, I actually asked you to help us a little bit. The, the question is, um, who do you want to win? But, uh, but I'm gonna ask you to back up a little bit. Um, who gets to vote? You're a Palestinian American. Do, do which pal There are Palestinians living in the West Bank, in Gaza, in East Jerusalem, in Israel, in refugee camps. Um, I understand that somewhere 11 or 12 million, something like that, Palestinians. I don't know what the total number is. How many, who are the ones who get to vote? And then as a little codicil, who do you hope is going to win if there is election? <laughs> yeah, and, 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 and that continues to be a big if, I think, although it seems like there is more, um, more progress towards that happening today than there has been um, in, in recent years. Um, you know, look, these are uh, elections uh, for uh, something called the Palestinian Legislative Council and for the presidency of the Palestinian Authority. Um, both of these are uh, Palestinian Authority entities. Um, and of course, the Palestinian uh, Authority was established through the uh, Oslo Accords uh, and, you know, exists in the West Bank and Gaza Strip in a couple of different forms. Um, uh, and, you know, uh, this is not uh, about uh, electing, um, you know, representatives for the Palestinian people writ large, um, and it is not, um, uh, unfortunately, um, set up in a way to produce a result like that. Um, if if these elections take place, the people who are going to be voting in them uh, or eligible to vote in them are, um, you know, uh, voting age Palestinians in the West Bank uh, and Gaza Strip. Um, it is uh, not clear uh, at this point if Palestinians in um, occupied Jerusalem uh, will be able to participate in these elections. Um, Whose call is that? Uh, well, the uh, it's it's a good it's a good question. There's I think that's a, a very political question. Um, you know, the uh, Israelis will obviously have their say, um, uh, but whether or not these elections uh, move forward uh, may have a lot to do with whether or not um, uh, there is an agreement on whether or not Palestinians in uh, occupied Jerusalem can participate in them. Um, you know, one of the uh, ways in which uh, elections for the Legislative Council uh, have been delayed repeatedly uh, has been because there has been uh, no solution found uh, to this um, to this problem. 
Um, and so, you know, some people would say that that is a genuine reason to delay elections and other people might say that that's an excuse to uh, delay uh, elections. Um, but in the best case scenario, um, you know, you would have uh, elections where voting age Palestinians uh, in uh, the West Bank, Occupy Jerusalem and Gaza participate in this. Um, what's uh, important to note here, of course, is these uh, are not um, all Palestinian stakeholders. Um, as uh, you mentioned, there are Palestinians who are um, living outside of the West Bank, Gaza, and uh, Jerusalem, uh, Palestinians who are, um, you know, uh, living in uh, neighboring countries and in, in refugee camps, um, uh, either integrated into those countries or still with refugee status. Um, Palestinians living in the broader diaspora, uh, all of whom continue to be stakeholders in the outcome, uh, but will not have an opportunity to uh, vote for representatives uh, in the uh, government of the, the Palestinian Authority. You know, I, I think there is both a need for um, renewal uh, in leadership uh, but also a serious need to address this fundamental problem of representation. Um, uh, and I don't think these elections, uh, while they, they might move us in the direction of uh, addressing renewal, uh, are not going to uh, fix that fundamental problem of representation. Um, and uh, so, you know, I don't think that uh, that bigger question, which is very important, uh, is going to be resolved here. Um, uh, but I do think that it's important that there be an opportunity for Palestinians to uh, voice who they want as uh, their leaders um, and do so in uh, a free way uh, that, um, you know, is uh, permitted to take place without the interference uh, of, um, you know, Palestinian factions and parties uh, or the Israelis or the Americans or anybody else. Um, and, you know, I is, is certainly I'm not making any endorsements of candidates or anything like that. Um, but I think that if we're able to have free and fair elections, uh, of, you know, for, uh, for Palestinian leaders, even in that limited way, um, that is a positive thing. Okay, thank you. Uh, I see now we're right, starting to get close to our end. Um, Yeri, um, would you like to answer, make a comment on this or can I move on to some others? Be, no, um, no, go ahead. There's a, I see a lot of questions that folks are asking. Okay, th thank you. Um, I have a, a number of people have shown interest in the question about the IHRA definition um, and the whole question of how to best uh, uh, deal with that, whether it's best by running around with a whack-a-mole, uh, tackling every time it comes up here, there, anywhere, or that there is a more strategic approach uh, to um, addressing this. The IHR right, is the International Holocaust Alliance definition of anti-Semitism, which is criticized by a lot of people, put forward by some people as an important element in, in defining what anti-Semitism is, so anti-Semitism can be fought, and criticized by others by saying that actually it adds quite a few examples, the main um, impact of which seems to be to protect Israel as opposed to fight anti-Semitism. So, um, um, Yosef. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, it's, it's important to do two things at the same time in the course of um, uh, doing this. First um, is making very clear uh, that uh, anti-Semitism is a problem. Um, it is a growing problem. Um, and it is one that um, uh, is a problem not, not just for uh, Jewish people, although first and foremost it is, uh, but it is a problem for anyone that believes in a kind of society that is um, uh, free from uh, bigotry and discrimination against all people. Um, and so I think we, we have to make clear that particularly as Palestinians, particularly as people who are uh, working uh, towards a society where we can be free and equal and free from bigotry and discrimination, um, that we too want to see anti-Semitism combated. 
uh, as we would with any form uh, of, uh, of bigotry. At the same time, it's important to make clear that this definition uh, is not about doing that. Uh, this definition is actually about doing something very different, uh, which is about um, manipulating a definition of anti-Semitism uh, to uh, instead silence criticism of Israel for the very purpose uh, of um, supporting a regime of discrimination against Palestinians on the ground. Um, and and, I, and I, I, I don't think there's any reason we can't do both of those things. And I think you know, where we have seen um, strong pushback efforts, uh, they've been within uh, this, uh, this framework. Um, uh, the question of is it you know a whack-a-mole strategy or um, you know something more comprehensive? Um, I I think it's probably going to have to be a little bit of both. Um, it's important for there to be a a broader strategy that makes clear that you know this is uh, this is not a good faith effort. This is not about combating anti-Semitism, but this is part of a broader pattern, a global pattern of silencing dissent against Israel's policies, uh, which is manifesting itself in a number of different ways. Uh, advocacy around the IHRA definition is just one of them, um, but so is anti-BDS legislation. Uh, so are targeted spear, smear campaigns and lawfare and all of these kinds of things that we've seen um, uh, proliferating over the last several years. Um, it's, it's important to identify that, contextualize it, and call it out. Um, and it's also important to have uh, localized and strategic responses um, to, um, you know, uh, efforts of pushing the IHRA at the institutional level. We've seen, you know, a number of successes on that front in universities in different places um, and, uh, and elsewhere. Um. Yara, can I go ahead with some others? Is that okay? Fine. Oh. Um, so there, I, I see we're running out of time. There are two questions that got a number of votes, and I'd like to ask you both questions. They're not quite on the same topic, uh, but they're related. So one is um, asking about the BDS principle of the right of return. Uh, do you comment on it? Do you support it? What do you think of it? Um, and the other is um, one from a, um, a Canadian, from a senior Canadian diplomat has some experience in the area, and he's asking whether a one-state solution can avoid being a replica of European settler colonialism that we see in Canada, US, Australia, and New Zealand. How, how could Israeli reluctance to abandon the Zionist goal uh, as a Jewish refuge be overcome? And that's quite linked actually to the right of return as well. Those are, those are linked uh, issues. So if you wouldn't mind giving us a little bit on that, uh, we'd appreciate it. Sure. Um... Let me um, can you, uh, remind me the first question was well, BD, uh, the BDS oh, principle of the right of return. return. Sure. Yeah. Okay. These are interrelated. I mean, I, let's let's address the second question. I think this is um, important to sort of start with. Um, look, the current situation that we have today is a a product of um, uh, settler colonialism. It is. Um, if uh, we have a, a single state in which you have um, uh, an equal right to vote, let's say, um, that political system is still going to be shaped by a century of settler colonialism. Um, the decolonization process, uh, as uh, our friends in Canada know, as we know here in the United States, um, is going to take a lot more than one man, one vote. Um, and I think it's much it's uh, much deeper than that, and has to be part of a a bigger process towards um, uh, achieving some approximation of historical justice. Um, and you know, countries like Canada and Australia and New Zealand and several others continue to struggle with this today, and are and are 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 not nearly doing uh, enough um, to to move in this direction. Um, so I think that, you know, this is not a question of would, would, would one state be a product of settler colonialism? That, that, right, this, what we have today and what we will have tomorrow and for some foreseeable future will be inevitably shaped by a settler colonial process. You can't erase 100 years of history uh, like that. 
it takes work and it takes time and it takes understanding the processes uh, that have been put in place and their impact uh, for a century and then figuring out um, how we rectify that uh, before we can uh, say we've you know uh, taken an important step away from settler colonialism in Israel Palestine whether we're talking about one state or two or ten uh, it's really the, the 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 how we divide it up is not really relevant to that um, to to that question. Um, when it comes to the right of return, um, you know, I, I I'm not sure exactly what the the question is. Um, the right of return is pretty straightforward. Uh, it is enshrined in international law, uh, in the United States Declaration of Human Rights. Uh, makes it makes it very clear uh, that people have a right to return to their country. Um, it's not a right that is unique to Palestinians. Um, it's it's a, a right that is guaranteed for human beings, um, and it should be afforded to Palestinians as it should be afforded to anybody else. Um, so, you know, uh, it, it is one of the one of the uh, three demands uh, of the BDS call, um, and you know, I don't see it. I don't see it being a particularly controversial one, but a, a rather straightforward one that. Uh, I think the vast majority of Palestinians understand to be necessary. Well, um, I have to disagree with you, Yosef. I think I'm, it is still quite a controversial issue. It's, there may be um, a consensus in certain view, certain areas, but it's still um, a subject that um, needs a lot more discussion. I think um, I think it's not well understood, uh, certainly in Canada, um, and that has to do with the Holocaust, the state of Israel, the protection for Jews, and so on and so forth. But I, what you're saying is the principle isn't um, is very clearly stated in international law, and I totally agree with you on that. Um, we're moving down to the very last uh, few minutes here. Um, I would uh, like to, uh, first of all, ask you not to go away, um, uh, either Yara or Moni. I just wanted to remind. Um, people of our upcoming seminars. Our next one we held a month from now. It's with John Allen, the former Canadian ambassador to Israel and um, board member of the New Israel Fund of Canada. Um, John is a very interesting fellow who I've known for close to 20 years, very thoughtful man. And we will be discussing all the different aspects of the um, Palestinian and Israeli uh, issue. And then after that, the month, month later, Diana Butu, uh, we'll be talking about what future she sees for Palestinians and Israeli Jews. Um, this is a reminder that our organization, OFIP, is voluntary and self-financed. Uh, we gratefully accept any donations that can be sent by e-transfer to this uh, address, and I will send this in a follow-up um, email to you. I also will say that I promise to uh, Dr. Munier, as I have to um, all our other speakers, that we will happily make a donation uh, to an organization of his uh, preference um, in the United States. And Joseph, you'll have to tell us how to do that going forward. Um, I'm going to thank um, Yara Shufani, and then I'm going to ask her to thank you for your contribution today. Yara, it's been a delight to have you with us uh, uh, today. Um, I know that CFOS is an important organization doing important work. And I congratulate you on being recently nominated as executive director. And thank you for adding um, uh, interesting questions to our conversation today. So Yara, the last word goes to you to thank uh, Dr. Munier. Oh, lots of pressure, just kidding. Um, thanks, Peter. And uh, thanks so much, Yusuf, for, uh, for this dialogue today. It's been really, really great. I know, um, you know, oftentimes uh, the Canadian political field seems like kind of intimidating um, and so seeing all of the successes that you've had and other American organizers have had on this issue um, is really inspiring and I think um, I know for myself I learned a lot and I'm really excited uh, and hopeful uh, in hearing about some of your wins and I think um, you know really celebrating the wins was is such a crucial part like you shared and um, it's been really great to hear about the, the challenges and the ways that um, that you've overcome some of those challenges and and really changed the political field in in the United States. So thank you so much for your time and for all of your work. It was a pleasure to be with you all. Thank you. 
and to all of those who are um, uh, registered, I will send be sending you a recording of the event so you can share it with your friends. Uh, also, a number of links, including this, um, the Twitter account that uh, Dr. Monier referred to, some information from uh, Yara, and also I'll be asking a request for comments. Uh, we do this every month. We try to improve every time. So we want suggestions both for new speakers and for ways that we could do it that would make it more easy for you. I'm sorry that we didn't get to all the questions. I apologize for that. Um, um, and um, we wish you all a good afternoon. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Bye-bye.